Coming up on this week's show, a Castlevania resurrection prototype for the Dreamcast has been found. Time Splitters 2 remaster hidden in Homefront. And we talk to video game pioneer Chris Crawford. The Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each week with our wonderful friends at Bitmap Books. Now, if you're a fan of Atari, you've got to check out Atari 2600 and 7800, a visual compendium that showcases the very best pixel art cover art and product design on each system spread over a massive 528 pages and featuring over 200 classic games definitely have a look at that and lots more as well on their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk hello and welcome to the retro hour podcast episode number 270 your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me dan wood me ravi abbott and me joe fox and a very warm welcome to this week's show, our favourite bit of the week just before the weekend, where we get to reminisce about classic video games from the golden age of gaming. Keep you up to date with everything that's been happening in the world of retro gaming and welcome on a video game pioneer. And I think the term pioneer definitely describes the guest that we've got this week. Yeah, this is Chris Crawford. And God, I've, I've wanted to have Chris on the podcast for a long time. I love these kind of episodes where we go into the really, really early days of gaming. And I'm talking about mainframe gaming. So, you know, Chris, he, he was developing games in 1976. And uh, he was doing punch cards, you know, back in the days. And uh, he was working on the IBM... 1130 which is a really early machine and the kim one as well which was commodore's first machine eventually he went on to work for atari and founded the games developer conference as well so chris (laughs) is an absolute legend and it's amazing to have him on the show because he talks about you know all these old mainframes and machines that were years before i was born and like i'm really interested in these pioneers and i'm really glad we can have him on you know what I love about it is, you know, it's a vast career and it goes back quite far. Like you say, when you say eventually he went on to Atari. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, for me, Atari is like, that's as far back as I know. Do you know what I mean? Like that's like, you know, late 70s, early 80s. But now that sounds amazing, man. Well, they, they were gaming with board games. So, you know, Chris was working uh, with an actual board game that he'd put out and, uh, you know, you'd have little tanks on there and then you'd have to play with coordinates. So (laughs) it's an absolutely amazing pioneering game, Tanktics. And there is something that's always fascinating me about mainframes. I mean, I I mentioned it on the show before that my mum used to be a mainframe operator, you know, before I was born in Mm. the 70s. And... I look at pictures of her in the papers back then. I mean, you know, just for using a computer was newsworthy <laughs> back then. She's Woman in the local uses paper. Computer. <laughs> yeah, so it'd be like, yeah, D- yeah. Den- Denise Wood prints out something on the printer, and it was like the size of like my house. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the fact that just all of that raw power, which I know you, your wristwatch has probably got a hundred thousand times more power than the mainframes of the seventies, but just seeing like you know the reel-to-reel tapes on there and. It all looks so mechanical with the flashy lights and the the punch cards as well. And it's just, I've always found it really interesting. And there's just something very cosy, I think, mm-hmm. about, you know, talking about mainframes of that era and uh, those really early games that people were playing on them. Because, I mean, these were machines that were designed for academic use for, you know, professors were using them. They were never made for gaming. It was just the fact that, you know, there was these generally kids who were using them either for their studies or out of hours. They kind of, you know... Abuse, abuse their privileges and started making games on them yeah it was it was like scientific community or or the army until like the Altier came out and and then later the kim one you know uh, which we also talk about they weren't accessible unless like chris you were in the scientific community and you had access to them and they were thousands and thousands of pounds as well like millions some of them. millions some of them yeah so uh it's it's pretty amazing to hear about these machines and uh it's just a bit of an education for us as well you know you know that is one reason that i love doing an independent podcast it's the fact that you know where else would you get a show talking about developing games on a, a 1976 ibm 1330 
Only here, man. Only here. <laughs> <laughs> but we have got lots more to talk about as well uh, before Chris Crawford. He's going to be on the show in around 20 minutes from now. Uh, but, I mean, there are some big stories as well that we need to update you about in the world of retro gaming very soon. Um, some really interesting Dreamcast developments that we found out about. An entire game has been found hidden inside Homefront that apparently no one can get to. We'll tell you why in just a bit. But before we do, let's take a moment to give a massive thank you to one of our sponsors this week who've made the Retro Hour podcast possible, and this is our wonderful friends at Curve. Now, Curve is all about simplifying your life by making your daily finances more efficient, which I think I can speak for all three of us. That is something that we need. Absolutely. I've always got cards everywhere and uh, Curve's really helped actually. And, you know, it it offers some things that uh, are really good for retro gamers. So there's like the go back in time feature, which enables you to switch payments from one card to another. Like that's 90 days after you've made the purchase as well. So let me get this right. Last night I was bidding on an Atari Jaguar, which I almost won. And I massively panicked when I almost won it because I had it on the wrong card. You're telling me. Yeah, you had I can it on the joint account, that... didn't you? Yeah, <laughs> I can go back and actually, I can hide the fact or change the fact that I'd spent it on the joint account. You, you've got 90 days to hide the fact. Oof, yeah. That's but good also, that is. <laughs> you get a uh, purchase protection as well, up to 100,000 euros. And, you know, this isn't charged. Uh, this is free, which is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and that purchase protection as well, because that, that is one thing for guys like us who do buy a lot of our gaming gear off places like eBay, and, you know, these are machines that were made a long time ago, generally don't come with a warranty. Mm. So, you know, if you're buying things on places like eBay, that is definitely worth having. And with Curve, you can actually have, you know, all your MasterCard and your Visas on one card and app, and all your loyalty cards as well. The amount of times, you know, my missus got a Boots card, and she got one for me as well. Every time I go in, they're like, have you got your Boots card? And I'm like, oh, it's at home in a drawer somewhere. I always forget loyalty yeah, cards. Yeah, I'm exactly the same. Boots card as well. It's exactly the same thing. CEX and game as well, it supports. Tes- Tesco cards, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, it really means that everything is in one place. You haven't got to carry around a massive wallet in your back pocket. All your spending is in one app with your debit, credit, and loyalty cards all in one place. And it boosts the power of all your cards to give you a 1% cash back at your favorite retailers. Great exchange rates across all of your cards as well. And those amazing features that we mentioned, the go back in time, free up some cash with that too. And we want you to try out Curve for yourself. Now, the Curve Blue card, it's got no monthly fees, but it will still boost all your cards. And we want to give you some free money. Well, this is really annoying because I signed up and now you've got this deal <laughs> where you actually get uh, five pounds off your first transaction. I was so going to say, didn't you I actually have waited? Up to, I was going to say, didn't you sign up to Curve like three, four weeks ago before we were even sponsored? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I'm a big fan. Yeah, so um, claim that £5 for your first transaction and give Curve a try. I mean, if you know guys like us that are tech curious, it's great to be in there at the start of something that's going to be ubiquitous in a few years. This is a way that it's all going to be done. I mean, it makes perfect sense. So you can sign up right now at curve.com slash retro and you will get £5 after your first transaction on the website right now, curve.com slash retro. And of course, support the Retro Hour podcast by supporting our sponsors. Thank you, Curve. Right then, let's talk about, I know one of your favourite series, Joe, Castlevania. A prototype has been found for the Sega Dreamcast of Castlevania Resurrection. Yeah, this is really interesting. So Ravi actually sent this earlier on. You said that uh, one of our one of our listeners actually sent this to you. Uh, yeah, he? Keith put it on our Discord, which awesome. is r- really cool. Awesome. So, um, yeah, I was watching the video earlier on. So I've, I've never heard of Castlevania Resurrection, but essentially it was revealed at E399. 1999 you know it was the new game you know the new castlevania game coming to dreamcast and uh it looks from the video looks really really similar to castlevania 64 um but obviously nicer because it's on the game uh, on the gamecube sorry on the dreamcast but essentially the game kind of got it got cancelled and from what i understand it was kind of like self-sabotaged by konami because they were worried about the ps2 come in and you know they knew that was on the horizon and they kind of just pulled the plug on the game But essentially, this has been uploaded uh, onto YouTube, three minutes of footage of somebody playing, you know, the development version of it. It's an unknown YouTube account. They don't know. There's no more information. So it's anonymous. Nobody knows where this guy's got it from, who this guy is or anything like that. But it looks legit. 
um, you know, all he does is he presses this pause button on the controller and he can go through the levels and just pick, and it goes into the developer mode and he can just pick the levels. I really want to know more about this, but yeah, it looks pretty cool, man. Is is this like known as one of the legendary Castlevania games? Because I know like Symphony of the Night was regarded as a really huge like, new I'm version not- of it too sure to be honest because I, I like Castlevania I really 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 enjoy Castlevania I love Symphony of the Night I love the original ones on the NES I love the SNES the two on the SNES I've never heard of Castlevania Resurrection interestingly I mean obviously it was it was there at E3 1999 um, but apparently it got a closed doors demonstration so I, I don't think it was kind of like seen by many people and there's not really much footage of it out there so I guess you are right. It's kind of like it's, you know, it's a legendary game that never, it's one of these games that never came out because the Castlevania Resurrection isn't a game. You know, it's not on N64. It's not on PlayStation. I mean, I could be completely wrong, but as far as I know, it's not out at all. So it was only going to be a Dreamcast game and Konami pulled the plug on it by the sounds of things just because they were worried about the PlayStation 2. But interestingly, the characters in the game, the two main characters of Castlevania Resurrection were then used in a Game Boy game in 1998, and then also in Castlevania, um, the Xbox 360 one, Lords of Shadow 2. So it was Victor Belmont and Sonya Belmont. So they reused the character like names and stuff for other games, but that's the only thing we ever saw from it, really. It does kind of seem to me, I mean, Castlevania is not really a series that I've been massively into, but I, it does kind of feel like there's a bit of a split in the castlevania fan base there are people that yeah. love the 2d games and then the 3d ones a lot of people generally don't really like on on the ps2 yeah you, you, you're pretty much completely right so you've got all your 2d castlevania games and obviously you've got the metroidvania kind of like style of games you know you know they pioneered that kind of style of game with symphony of night and there's a massive fan base people love those ones i tend to gravitate towards them i do have nostalgia for the two n64 ones because i had them when i was a kid and i do enjoy them um but gen generally they, the 3D ones don't tend to get reviewed as well and they're not as loved as well. But I think there's a lot of people who are nostalgic for the N64 ones and for the PlayStation 2 ones. Um, and then the 360 ones, the um, Lords of Shadows, I played the first one, they're pretty good. But yeah, generally there's, there's quite a big split and you know all the Game Boy Advance ones and DS ones and stuff are all the 2D ones and there's a massive fan base for them. But yeah, this was a 3D one that looks really similar to the N64 ones. And I love the fact as well that this game was going to come out in, well, it was, it was previewed in 99, like you said. And it was yeah. it was already the 17th game in the series, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> I love how, like, apparent, I love the apparent, like, they pulled the plug on it. PlayStation 2 is coming. Let's get rid. <laughs> yeah, well, that was, that was one of the things that really damaged the Dreamcast, didn't mm. it? Because, I mean, it was such an amazing system. And, it, you know, we've talked about it on the show before that really... I wish that the community had the love for the Dreamcast back in the day that it does now. Because, you know, it feels like it's one of those systems that 20 years on, people really appreciate it now. But at the time, everyone was just like, oh, PS2's coming, forget Sega. Well, it, it's interesting because it's just like, I mean, we're going off topic a little bit here, but like, even I was, I was what, like 10 years old in 99. I don't even remember there being any buzz about the Dreamcast. I was a Sega boy through and through. And it was, it was just like, oh yeah, PlayStation, PlayStation's coming now. Like, it's so weird. Like, even, you know, the fans of the Mega Drive and the Saturn and stuff like that, I feel, just, I feel like, you know, well, I mean, my first time experience, it happened to me. But yeah, man, this this would be great to see this get dumped, you know, get dumped somewhere so we can play it. Yeah, what well, could have been, no way. Um, but if you do want to check this out, I mean, we'll put the video in our show notes. Hopefully, now that a video's out there, it won't be too much longer until a, a cheeky little um, CD image surfaces. That will be quite nice to uh, give it a try. You know, I think one of the comments on the, the article here on PC World says, the Dreamcast, the gift that keeps on giving. Which, yeah, you know, absolutely I agree is. with that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back a little bit earlier than the Dreamcast. What about to 1988? to a soccer game that actually, because Ravi's been doing a bit of tweaking on our website over the last couple of days, and now on our homepage, you can go back and see every episode of the Retro Hour, all 270 of them, in a big list on there. And I scrolled right back to the beginning, and John Hare, Sensible Software, was one of our early guests. And actually, this is a game, not that I want to listen to an episode that old, because I'm sure I sound cringeworthy on those. John will sound fantastic, of course. But there's a game called Micropro Soccer, that Sensible Software worked on before they did Sensible Soccer. Um, and this was a game that was really popular. I remember it being on the Commodore 64. Um, there were obviously you know later versions of Micropro Soccer as well. In America, initially it came out as Keith Van Aaron's Pro Soccer. Not being a football fan, I've no idea who Keith Van Aaron is. 
I bet he's got good 80s hair. Let's have a look. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you were a fan of Micropro Soccer, I mean, it did kind of get overshadowed by Sensible and Kickoff, obviously. I remember everyone playing Kickoff 2 and Sensi at school. Uh, but now you can actually get hold of Micropro Soccer on Steam. Yeah, this is really interesting. So Micropro Soccer. Um, I used to play the Amiga version, actually. So these ones look a little bit primitive to me. Um, but the 1988, when it was released, there's this Steam port, and it's actually a port of the MS-DOS version. Um, so it's kind of running in DOSBox at the moment. But it's really cool to see this kind of above-view style and interesting title for them to actually bring out. Like, you know, Sensi came out in 1992, so uh, there's a big change there. And... Like, you know, if if you've played Kickoff and stuff, it's got that kind of above view, same vibe, whereas Sensi was the little pixel people. And actually, I mean, I'm I'm terrible at games like FIFA. You know, I've got mates who are well into FIFA and they're always like, you know, let's have a game. And I'm like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't even know what which character on screen I'm controlling when I play FIFA. Yeah. But the older games <laughs> like Kickoff and, you know, Sensible Soccer, I can actually play those. And not that I'm any good at them, but I, I can kind of follow what's going on. You can well, figure it, out which one you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, so it had a good some start. quite innovative stuff. So it had like an a- action replay uh, feature when the goal was scored. And it even had like on C64 version, like black and white lines that would be like a video rewinding, you know, on the kind of replay. And, uh, some some weird moves like the banana kick as well and stuff. So it was it was quite innovative, and I, I I used to really enjoy that when I was a kid. Actually, on the Amiga, you know what's weird though is why they picked the DOS version instead of the C sixty four version to release on here. Because I mean I, I don't know if it was maybe the DOS version was bigger in America, but I don't even remember seeing that version of it back in the day. It was like you said, it was sixty four and then the Amiga version that I used to see around. And maybe because because of DOS Fox, you know, it's probably Easy, yeah, easier yeah. to do. But like looking at the video, the sound isn't amazingly good on this DOS version. It's a bit What do you mean this? <laughs> maybe jump. all the way through the game. I think C sixty four might sound a bit cooler, but uh... <laughs> You mean you weren't a fan of the PC speaker back in the day? I kind of liked it, but, uh, you know, not not on a constant loop. It can uh, drive you mad. Well, you want to hear it again? <laughs> no, no, stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that does run all the way through the game. I'm having um... my nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is cool. I mean, this is um, a company called uh, Ziggurat Games, and they're, they're, at the moment they're simply on a mad mission to uh, get loads of kind of forgotten retro classics onto Steam. Because um, I know, obviously, GOG seems to be the main platform where people go for this kind of thing. It is cool that more of them are coming to Steam, though, because it does feel like, you know, Steam is a bit more of a mainstream platform than GOG. Yeah, it's it's like some of them are done better as well. So so that that, that like some of them are nicer ports than the GOG ones, and some of them are worse. Like, it's it's really pick of the bunch at the moment with the Steam stuff. Like, um, I was playing Robin of Sherwood, and uh, everyone was just like, get the GOG version, get the GOG version, because the... Uh, no, no, get the Steam version. So, like, it depends how much effort they're putting in, but if this is like a solo release of a title, then I think it's, it's going to be a lot better and a lot more configurable. I must admit, generally, when I'm buying, you know, if I'm purchasing classic PC games to play on my PC, it is usually via GOG because you don't need like a front end to load them. Not that I mind it about Steam too much, but it feels like they're a bit more portable. Yeah, and you get the free titles on GOG as well. Like um, Mm. I I use GOG, but launch it via Steam. So I've got all my stores, but they all they all launch through Steam, which is pretty good. If you do get hold of Micropro Soccer, it is back. It's on Steam and uh, available now. Now, something that I know you'd be very excited about, Joe, a full 4K remaster of Time Splitters 2 that, unfortunately, you'll probably never get to play. Yeah, this has blown my mind. So I wasn't aware of this. So apparently this was something some people are aware of. So on the game Homefront The Revolution, which I've never played, I've never played the Homefront games, but I know the first one's an Xbox 360 and PS3 title. Um, wonderful titles. Is like, this the second one, Homefront, The Revolution, I'm assuming? Or is that the first one? I'm not too I sure. I think that might have been the first one. But, is that um, the first? I feel like the full I, name of it. Yeah, can I do a little bit of Nottingham history first with this? Yeah, go for it, man. Yeah, so Rare 
as, as you know, did Goldeneye. Yeah. And then Time Splitters came out from Free Radical Designs, which was yeah. also based in Nottingham with uh, David Doak, our friend that we've uh, done many talks with. And, uh, you know, I, I used to do video game events with him. Mm. And then it turned into Crytek Studios. So Crytek yeah. was underneath the flat where I used to live. Yeah, man. That's so cool. I was like, oh, my God, crisis. Oh, that's <laughs> getting done underneath where I used to live. And then I used to go down to the car park and uh, it turned to uh, Deep Silver Dam Buster Studios. Yeah. And, uh, but Crytek were actually working on the home front game and then the, the second time, home yeah. front got done by dam buster i think so i used to see these developers in the car park and like shout give me beta codes and stuff like that <laughs> they Where's never work for <laughs> yeah but um the guy that's actually talking about this is matt phillips and yeah you, you may remember matt phillips from uh big evil court and those were the guys that did uh tanglewood oh yeah 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 so matt actually worked at the time um for crytek yeah yeah See, it's, so it's, in, it's interesting because i loved time splitters one two and future perfect and i never knew you know as a kid that they were from like the midlands they were from like nottingham and derby i did i had no idea so this yeah. like blo- this just blows my mind now talking about it it's it's mad mate <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's so crazy it's like it's, but tide splitters is close to my heart <laughs> i know so, so i mean like you say this comes from Crytek developer Matt Phillips, um, who was probably one of the guys you were shouting at across the car park, you know, give me a free, you know, give me a free game. He probably thought you were mugging him or something, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he's actually, this is responding to a Twitter feed where a designer called JW Nijman asked, you know, um, what are some of your like favorite hid- hidden Easter eggs that you've put into games yourself? And essentially, Matt Phillips has turned around and said, my proudest moment was a fully playable native 4K port of Time Splitters 2 hidden in the arcade machines in Home from the Revolution. So apparently, people knew that you could play the first two levels, uh, level one and level two of Time Splitters 2, on the arcade machines in, in Home Front, which I had no idea. I, I've never seen about that or anything, but apparently people knew that. But essentially, there is a way there where you could play the entire game and you it would boot up the multiplayer like the multiplayer version of Time Splitters 2 and then you could back out of it and you could play the entire game even the network stack was in there yeah like everything was in there apparently but essentially he never revealed the easter egg he gave it to a friend to reveal on i want to say it was on discord or something you know he you know he said go go reveal this this is the code you need to put in to get onto it and essentially his friend posted it <laughs> And it got closed. the The feed got closed down for being fake news. Oh, and man. then, and, and then well. he doesn't remember the code anymore. So Matt Phillips doesn't remember the code. He said it was in a notepad, you know, from all these years ago, which is now gone. Um, the feed that was posted about it got closed for being fake news. So it's been lost. So hopefully, some sort of data miner is going to find it for us. I'm hoping some hacker like yeah. starts looking through the code and then finds the full title there, or, or like reverse engineers or brute forces it somehow yeah. <laughs> like you know maybe sets up an emulator that's just hammering in every combination and leaves it running like yeah, man. I'm, I'm just trying to think how this can get done because that would be absolutely awesome and it's 4k as well well this is the thing you know there's there's a petition for a time splitters remake um on facebook and it's got like four hundred thousand followers you know, so people people are out there wanting it. And there's a fan made, you know, Time Splitters Rewind, which we've spoken about before. So, you know, I've got a good feeling, touch wood, that by the time we're recording next week, one of our stories will be that this is out. Because like, you know, people if do it you so didn't quickly. know about this, you'd probably think it's BS, like just the way that it sounds and like, you know. Yeah. But the, the way that the licenses have gone uh, from yeah. company to company, who's involved yeah. with it as well, it's like, a really, really kind of amazing story, and especially losing the code. I hope yeah. it's not like one, two, three, four, five. Or... <laughs> Can you imagine? Like, I mean, I'm not too sure how it. I've never played Homefront, um, so I'm not too sure how it works. But yeah, apparently it's in the arcades in the game. So you know, for somebody to find that and then just dump it for us all to play would just be absolutely unreal. I just want to play Homefront again now. <laughs> no, you just want to play Homefront now, yeah. <laughs> It is weird though, because it's obviously. I mean, they. I guess they own the copyrights to both of those games. Yeah. 
but but it's weird how it was kind of hidden in that. I, I guess he kind of put it in, you know, without without telling his bosses, yeah, that he was doing it. But I imagine that must have been quite a job though to remaster yeah, the entire it, 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 game again in four K. I was going to say it's not. Some, it must have been not, a few people in the studio because the same staff would go on to the other one and on to the other. So maybe there were like four or five of them. Like, should we sneak time splitters into that? <laughs> yeah i love that like it's it's not something he's done on his lunch break i imagine that's a full-time job to like poor <laughs> and the fact that he got this guy got banned on discord i mean um yeah hopefully the, the lift is banned now this, this is this has been revealed someone screenshotted it or something yeah yeah that'd be great <laughs> yeah some moderator with a red face in uh in the channel on discord now um but yeah fingers crossed um we do eventually get into that like you said there's got to be a way like you know some disassembly or you know just kind of yeah, brute force in it. That would be great to get it unlocked so everyone can play it. Get your game genie out. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> now, one thing that we do like to keep an eye on is classic video games selling for astronomical prices. And there's being another one. Is this the biggest fee that a Super Mario Kart has fetched so far? This is $660,000 a copy of Super Mario Brothers on the NES has gone for. Yeah, this is silly, man. This sold this week um, at Heritage Auctions. Now, I'm wondering whether this is the copy of Mario Bros, which was on Porn Stars, where the guy wanted a million for it. Um, and they did appraise it saying, you know, it could worth, it could well be worth that. But yeah, this is a sealed copy of Super Mario Bros for the original Nintendo, which has sold for 660k. Um from what I understand, the reason it sold for so much and it's so rare is because of the variant. It's the f- it's the rare fourth production variant of this game, uh, which can be ad- identified by the fact that it's got a shrink wrapped seal rather than a sealed sticker, seal with a sticker. So it's the way it's been packaged and the way it's been shrink wrapped, which makes it the rarer version of Super Mario Bros. Which is really funny because in this you know in this article on Game Byte. Essentially, it's saying, you know, the game itself is not rare. What's rare is the way it's been packaging. You're, you're spending £660,000, $660,000, sorry, on on the cellophane. <laughs> I, I think also the hang, the hang tab was a big yeah. part of it as well. And looking yeah, at the, the hang grading tabs, at yeah. the top, it's like, yeah, it's it near per- hang tag, tab as the first thing. Yeah, so the grading is near perfect, 9.6. Um, a plus, you know, it's been graded by several places, but... Um, What's really interesting is, you know, the tweet from, is it, um, is it Kel- Kelsey Lewin, who's on the Metal Jesus show? Um, she's like, for context, the Nintendo PlayStation prototype sold for 300000 which well, for like, me is so much more interesting. Really nice house or a copy of sealed Super Mario. <laughs> 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 you know? Or the PlayStation, the Nintendo Play, I think the Nintendo PlayStation is much, much more interesting thing to own, <laughs> personally. It is. It? I'd love to hear from the person who actually spent Six hundred and sixty thousand dollars. I can guarantee it's gonna be copy. one of these guys is gonna be like it's an investment. I can sell this on. I can sell this for more, kind of thing. Elon Musk is gonna drop it on the moon. Or yeah. On Mars. That would be the next uh, or, move. Or set it on fire with a flamethrower or something. No. Yeah. <laughs> you know the thing about it though is obviously, you know, the the person who did buy this. I imagine probably has a fair bit of disposable income. So the stress probably wouldn't be as much as it would be for us guys. I mean, if I had a copy of this in my house, <laughs> it was worth more than my house. I, where would you put it? Obviously in a safe, I guess. I'd sell it. I'd, I, I'm just going to go ahead. I'm a massive game collector, but if I had something worth that mm. kind of money, I'd have to sell it. You know, I could just imagine. I'd have to. <laughs> Dan's dog <laughs> chewing on it. <laughs> just like, no. <laughs> Samantha, it's all right. He only took the cellophane off. The game's fine. Yeah, Dan would just be like, I left it so like carefully on the couch as well. <laughs> yeah, typical me. Yeah, that's, that's why I'll, uh, I'll never be able to afford $660,000 for a, a rare copy of Super Mario. I'm not responsible enough no, for that. Nor am I. <laughs> now, speaking of money, um, we did mention this on the show when it was announced that um, a new £50 note which is actually the biggest banknote, I believe, that we have here in the UK. Um, have you ever kinda... seen one, Dan, or held a £50? That was one thing I was going to say, because, I mean, for people who don't live in the UK, £50 notes are actually not that common in everyday use. I think the only times I've ever had them is, you know, when I've gone to the bank and had to take out money for landlord deposits and take it to letting agents that kind of when thing i worked in, in retail we were told not to accept them and that was probably just because 
there were so many fakes out there. So so making a new note totally makes sense. I've only ever had three fifty pound notes myself, which is funny that I've made no, like mental notes of them in my lifetime. But I worked in retail for a good five six years in my early twenties, and we used to handle them, you know, about one a week. But considering you you would handle a thousand twenty pound notes, you know, in a day compared to like one fifty pound note a week kind of thing. Yeah, I mean they're not really in widespread use. I mean, apart from, you know, special circumstances, not the kind of thing you carry around in your wallet and use in day to day. But all the rest of our banknotes here in the UK have gone from paper to um, polymer over the mm. last few years. I think this is the last one now. I think you know, all the rest are, aren't they? Um, but the big deal about the new £50 note is that Alan Turing is on there, who, of course, um, legendary computer scientist and code breaker, um, you know, back in World War Two. He had a huge role cracking the Enigma code that was used by Germany in World War II and also recognised for incredible work in maths and computer science. And he actually features on the back or the front, depending on which way you look at the note, on the new £50 note. But actually there are cool little Easter eggs buried in here as well then in the in the note design. Yeah, it's, it's great to see a tribute to Alan Turing. He's kind of the father of the digital computer, really. And, uh, and, and AI, really. And AI, it? yeah. And uh, it, there's loads of little tributes to um his work in this so the the bomb machine which was the machine that he used to decrypt enigma uh, there's technical drawings on there there's like a binary ticker tape in there the queen even has a microchip next to her which is <laughs> incredibly modern but also um amazingly you know he worked for gchq which was a british intelligence service and um they've created a thing called the Turing Challenge. Now, the Turing Challenge uh, is a series of really tough puzzles. And, like, if you've ever seen a film, The Imitation Game, the way that they would test people about code breaking and ciphers were with crosswords and, and really tough challenges in papers, and then they'd be able to find these coders and uh, deciphers for kind of the war effort and, um, you know, getting these coded machines well these puzzles have been announced and they are incredibly hard <laughs> like you know some of the hardest in the world one of these puzzles uh on the gchq touring challenge you have to actually use your own enigma simulator to <laughs> decode it as well so i'm glad you there was a, i'm glad you can use a simulator because when you sent this over i misinterpreted and i thought you had to have an actual enigma machine which i'm sure are worth <laughs> like, like tens of thousands of pounds now <laughs> like, yeah. you've got to get one like. no i think they're not making them public <laughs> um, but i think if you probably um solved all of these 12 puzzles you'd probably be getting a call from a uh, a man in black kind of guy that would uh, <laughs> say, oh, what, what are you up to? <laughs> you <know? laughs> Do you fancy a job? Where'd you get that Enigma machine from, Joe? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's an emulator on my phone. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that is awesome, though. And it's a great design. Just too bad I'll probably never get to see one in person. But if you do want to check it out, and um, we've got the design and more information on that challenge that I'll put in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, we're going to be talking about um, really old school video games with Chris Crawford talking about mainframe gaming and then going into his time working at Atari and founding the Game Developers Conference, you know, GDC, that is, of course, a go to place um, in gaming these days. So we'll, we'll get right back to the roots of that with Chris in just a moment. Before we do, let's give another big mention to a very dear friend of ours who've supported the Retro Hour podcast, and this is our friends at ExpressVPN. Now, of course, we've watched so much Netflix over the last 12 months. I mean, you know, you've said yourself, Joe, that you've pretty much rinsed the entire UK Netflix library I, of anything you find interesting. On. I have, I literally, I sit there every night after my wife goes to bed and I, I think I'm going to watch a film tonight and I just end up like just watching scrolling. Friends. Yeah, just watching <laughs> the same stuff, man. Just scrolling through Netflix, just thinking to myself, like, it's just the same stuff on here, man. Well, if you want to unlock more content, I mean, you know, you're paying for Netflix every month. ExpressVPN lets you change your online location. So then when you open that Netflix app, it thinks that you're in a different country. And obviously, due to like licensing around the world, there are almost 100 different Netflix libraries, all with localized content on them. So if you use ExpressVPN, open the app, select a location, 
Tell it where you want to pretend you're from. Tap one button to connect and then refresh Netflix and you've got access to thousands of new shows and movies that you previously couldn't access on your local Netflix. Like, Rav, you've been watching stuff for weeks now on the American Netflix. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's all in HD. Uh, There's no problem with buffering or lag. And, like, I actually installed it on my router recently because I got a new router. I installed it on my Fire Stick as well. So you could just have it on there, the app on there. And on the router, I can change one of my whole networks to be in another country, which is fantastic. So straight away, just go onto my TV and um, watch some American stuff, which is not available. So a movie that I absolutely love with Justin Logg, who was, uh, you know, the I'm a Mac, I'm a PC guy. <laughs> um, it's accepted where they make a fake university. Also, a great documentary about the last blockbuster store ever in uh, Bend, Oregon, which is really cool. And uh, Porn Stars as well. And that's P-A-W-N Stars <laughs> that I've been watching. <laughs> and, you know, they've got some cool retro items in there occasionally and uh, lots of good history stuff as well. Yes, I mean, if you're into anime, you know, why don't you connect to the Japanese Netflix? Or, you know, if you want to watch Doctor Who and you're outside the UK, check it out on the UK Netflix. So, And it works with other streaming services too. I mean, Hulu, BBC iPlayer, YouTube, you know, has videos that are only available in certain countries. Streaming HD, no buffering, no lag, and compatible with all your devices, your phone, your laptop, smart TVs, and lots more as well. Not only can you change your location, but also it encrypts your data and lets you surf the web safely and anonymously. So trust the VPN that we use and sign up today and you will get an extra three months on top of a one-year subscription to ExpressVPN. So that is three months of ExpressVPN for free by heading to this website right now, tap it into your phone or your computer, expressvpn.com slash retro to get your three months of ExpressVPN, expressvpn.com slash retro. Now, let's just take a quick moment to give a massive thank you to our incredible patrons. You know, we, we talk about Patreon every week on this show, obviously, and we, we can't express our gratitude enough for the people who find it in their hearts and support this show and enjoy what we do so much that they want to contribute to it and keep it going each week. We've had so many nice comments coming in from people and stuff recently, and it's just fantastic to have this kind of community of patrons. Like, when we meet up, we do... Um, Retro Hours After Hours, which is a, a great podcast where we're talking about the behind-the-scenes stuff. We did, oh, the Future Hour recently, which is really interesting, where we talk about our mad visions of the future, <laughs> and some of them were pretty crazy. Um, but also, we do our patron meetups as well, which are fantastic, like Zoom calls, where you've got everybody talking about their retro stuff, their setups, you know. We, we talk about loads of different topics in them. Yeah, and we've got one coming up this weekend on Sunday evening, actually. So if you want to join us for that, um, support us on Patreon. Come and say hello. It's just great fun, isn't it? Just like, you know, talking to other like-minded people. I often think having Patreon and the community that we've got around it, it almost turns it into a bit like a virtual user group. Yeah, it's good because, you know, I, I love chatting about retro. and It's a good place to actually do it on the Discord. And, and like, also... God, you know, it's so hard to find support and stuff um, if, if you're making a system, if you're, if you're kind of trying to set something up and you can just pop on and ask one of these patrons and they'll be like, oh, yeah, sure, you just plug it in there and do that. And you're like, what? You know, it's, it's really good. Absolutely. So if you'd like to join us for this weekend's patron hangout, we would love to see you there. And like Ravi mentioned as well, you also get access to our second podcast that we do exclusively for patrons, the Retro Hour After Hours, where we have a different theme in each episode. Always loads of fun doing that as well. Letting our hair down and, you know, anything can happen on that show. And you'll get the usual podcast often early. You'll get it ad free as well. But really you're doing it just to show your support to the podcast and make sure that we can cover the cost of doing this each week. You know, any money we're getting to patrons, that really helps us to keep covering the cost of doing the podcast each week. So we massively appreciate your support and you will get a mention in a future episode of the show in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. And making their place immortalised in the Hall of Fame this week, a big thank you to Jonathan Quilter. Fabrice Deville. Retro Hammer. Edward Fitzpatrick. And Zach Huge Thanks. <laughs> a huge thanks to you, Zach. So if you'd like to support us, all the details are on our website at theretrohour.com. Right then, let's get into mainframe gaming, early development on the Kim 1 and the IBM 1330 into Atari, and then 
founding GDC. With this week's special guest, Chris Crawford, is next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is our absolute pleasure to welcome on this week's special guest. And actually, we're so excited to get some stories from the early days of the industry. I mean, we were just talking before we started recording that, you know, today video games and computers are everywhere. You know, the video games industry is the biggest entertainment medium in the world. And it all came from just a few people working on this incredible stuff back in the 60s and 70s. And today we're going to be joined by Chris Crawford talking about mainframes and the Altair and the Kim One and Punch Card Gaming and Avalon Hill. So let's welcome him onto the Retro Hour podcast. Hello, Chris. Hi there. Great to have you joining us. Now, before we get into your history, because I know you're quite well known for Atari, but actually it's, we're going to explore the period before that, which I think is going to be so interesting as it's not really something we hear all that much about. So it's going to be fascinating hearing your stories. I mean, what was the first, what we'd broadly call a computer that you remember seeing? Oh, well, actually, that was while I was in high school, I believe. My father worked for the Air Force, and uh, one Saturday, he had to do some work, and he invited me to come along and play with the computer there, and they had a terminal system using a language called Josh, and uh, I just played around with it, and it didn't do very much, but it was my first experience with a computer. Shortly thereafter, uh, in in my first year in college, I did some scientific programming in Fortran. And basically, I had to teach myself all the Fortran and uh, how to use that computer. And it was a very slow computer. I still remember it did a a calculation that would have taken a modern computer a few fractions of a second. Uh, In my case, though, it went on for about five minutes before I realized that there was an error in the calculation. And I remember saying, stop the computer, stop the computer. I'm I'm it's producing bad data. Yeah, that was my freshman year in college. And then all throughout college, I continued doing more and more scientific computing. Uh, with bigger and bigger computers. And uh, in grad school, I did, I mean, my master's thesis it was a computer project involving dynamical parallaxes of visual binary stars. And uh, so I did an awful lot of Fortran programming on the mainframes in those days. And mostly what that involved was first you'd... Uh, type up your program on the punch cards. We use the standard uh, 80 column punch cards. And uh, then you <laughs> you did the, all the punching in what was called the key punch room because the key punch room was isolated from everything else because the key punch machines were extremely loud. Uh, these weren't typewriters. These things had to punch holes in some thin cardboard cards. And so they hit hard. And so when you (laughs) pushed a button, there was a loud bang. And then, of course, as you're typing, it's bang, 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 bang. And of course, there are a dozen other people in the same room going on. And so it was was a huge, loud cacophony of of noise. Uh, Once you got your cards all set up, then you took them into the I.O. room where uh, you handed your cards to a guy, you, you wrapped them in a uh, rubber band, handed the cards to a guy who then put them in a, a box. And from there, they would be at some point in the future taken into the computer room, which mere mortals were not allowed to enter. And they would run the program and it would print something out. And then they'd wrap your cards up in the printout and put it in a little box in the outer room. And uh, the other, th- but this took a while because there were so many programs running. And so there was always, there was ca- something called the TAT board. TAT meant turn around time. And they, it was a chalkboard where they'd say, TAT, uh, three hours, uh, TAT, eight hours. During the day, it would be typically eight hours. So if you had a lot of work to do, you'd come in at two in the morning 
when the turnaround time was maybe 30 minutes. And so you could actually do interaction. You could put something in, see what happened. A short time later, put in another round. And that's the way we did computing back then. Well, you mentioned that your dad was in the Air Force. Like back then, was was it kind of military and educational scientific people that had access to computers and not the general public? Well, my dad was a civilian engineer for the Air Force, um, but he, uh, at the Air Force Base, where the uh, computer was, that was a general purpose computer that did all the work for the whole base. And so there were a lot of people using it. And so uh, I was using a terminal, which uh, was part of it. This was time sharing back then. That is, they could have 20 terminals scattered around the base and you could put in your input and it would go to the computer and the computer would get around to processing it normally within a minute and then shoot the output back at you. And it came out in one of the standard terminals of the day, which looked like big typewriters on pedestals with a uh, printer paper coming out of them. Well, what kind of programs were you writing on these machines? Well, while I was a student, I was uh, writing basically various kinds of research programs. I was pursuing a number of different research projects over the years. Uh, one was on the time series of meteor observations. That was something I was always interested in. Or do they come randomly or not? Again, my uh, master's thesis was on dynamical parallaxes. I also did a number of little bits and pieces uh, for, some, uh, for some of the professors, various little bits, uh, fairly short programs, a few hundred lines. That was about all. When I was at, uh, when I was teaching, I had two main programs I worked on. The first was an educational program for my students called Black Hole Chicken, where they uh, guided a rocket around a black hole and tried not to fall in, but they had to come as close to the uh, Schwarzschild radius as possible without falling in. And then I also did my very first war game on that IBM 1130. And it turned out to be pretty good considering the restrictions. I called it Tanktics. It was a tactical armored combat game played on a hex grid. And that in itself was uh, rather ambitious. The mathematics of calculating things in hex grids are a lot messier than rect grids, the rectangular, you know, squares. Uh, when you have hexes uh, fitting together, the way the way you draw lines through them can get kind of complicated. I figured that out, and then I had some fairly simple algorithms for uh, tanks to move around. I had a limited amount of terrain, and so in many cases you wouldn't see the enemy tanks until you had a, you know, a, a what was called a proper line of sight. And once it calculated a line of sight, it would notify you, oh, guess what? There's an enemy tank at this hex right here. And then you reacted to that. I gave the computer twice as many tanks as the human had. And it turned out that was a fairly balanced arrangement. That is, I got beaten by the computer a few times. Most of when I had other people play with it, most of them were beaten. I could beat it much of the time. I knew the algorithms. <laughs> how how kind of hard was it to create a computer opponent back then as well with such limited memory? Well, not as hard as I had thought. The basic algorithm was sort of wander around in the general direction of the enemy until you see them. And as soon as you see them, notify all the other tanks and have everybody close in on it. Uh, so it was fairly straightforward algorithm. There was, yeah, there was, well, no, I did have a flanking algorithm too. Depending on the situation, you might try to go to the left or to the right of the enemy computer. But uh, that was as far as I took it with the Fortran version. Uh, this basic design went through quite a few variations as it, it was on multiple different computers. The first version was on the IBM 1130. 
but the uh, later on I moved it to my cam and then it was on a pet and so forth. Well, what made that IBM 1130 such an important machine? Well, I wouldn't call it an important machine. It was sort of one of the cheapest of them, which is why my community college had one. But, I mean, there were other machines. Uh, the University of California at Davis, where I did my undergraduate work, had a Burroughs 5500, which was later upgraded to a 6500. And I don't know the specs on that machine at all. The main IBM machine was the 360 at that time, uh, much more powerful than the 1130. And there were also mini computers uh, like the PDP-11. Uh, these were really meant to be controllers for experiments in laboratories and so forth. They weren't meant to be general purpose programming computers. And uh, we had uh, the physics department at the University of Missouri had a PDP-11 that I used for I forget what I used it for, but I did use the thing, <laughs> although there's a good story about it. Back then, printing technology, we didn't have anything like inkjet technology and certainly nothing like uh, laser technology. Back then, there were two only two types of printers, impact printers. Well, actually, there was an inkjet printer back then. The physics department had one, only it worked on a completely different uh, process it used ink that had uh, uh, very, very fine particles of iron mixed into it. And it used magnets to control the stream of ink. And so the, uh, the carriage would slide back and forth across the page and spray ink. And then the, uh, the electric fields would would point the ink at exactly the right spot. And the problem was it needed very high voltage to deflect the stream of ink. And I still remember once I was working and it was printing something out and it jammed. Uh, paper jams were very common in those days. So I turned the machine off and uh, waited a minute and then went to undo the jam and I reached inside the printer and I touched the wrong wire and I got clobbered with oh. a few thousand volts. Ouch. <laughs> uh, because the, the capacitors held that voltage for a good while. That was the way computing was in those days. Did Avalon Hill like have any kind of investment in this? And did they think, you know, this, this would be an interesting idea to have, you know, computer titles? No, not at the time. I mean, these were very, well, to give you an idea, I sold the very first commercial strategy computer war game on December 30th, 1978 uh, to a lawyer in Woodland, California. I, I know that because I was way, way ahead of everybody else. That was a, a Commodore pet version of the Tanktics game. And... Uh, I then started selling that game commercially, and I think I sold about 150 copies of that. That was the first commercial. There were a few other games out there, and there were certainly games where you shot at things, but they were video games. This was the first real strategy war game. Um, and then later on, Avalon Hill picked it up. They asked me to do it again, uh, redo it. Uh, and have a version for the Apple and the Atari and the TRS-80 uh, and the Commodore PET. So they published that and in, what, 83, I believe, maybe 82. Well, in those early days when you were self-publishing it, I mean, how was um, Tanktix originally packaged and duplicated? I mean, <laughs> we, we kind of doing it all by hand? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I I... I went to a printer and I had this big map that was like 24 by 36 inches. And uh, we folded that down so that it was eight and a half by 11, I think, or something like that. And then we, uh, we needed counters, little cardboard units. And so I had purchased a bunch of blank counters and I used an, I had an ink stamp made and I stamped out the numbers on the, uh, uh, on the counters 
And then I would record the tape uh, directly on my computer. That the, tape, the programs were stored on cassette tapes. And then I would uh, stuff everything into a big Ziploc bag. Oh, and I also had the, uh, the manual for it, which I had printed. And so the manual and the counters and the tape and the map all went into this Ziploc bag. And that's what I sold. And the, I sold some to retail stores. The standard way software was sold then was in Ziploc bags. Basically, they set up a big uh, perforated board wall that had, uh, the, this was a standard thing that you had in garages. You could, uh, you had little steel things you stuck into the holes and then you could hang stuff from the little steel pegs. And we, uh, I sold a bunch to them, but there was, that was any computer store. You went in and there was this wall of pegboard and you would look over the software. And that was the entire supply of software in the universe. Uh, So (laughs) there wasn't a lot of software back then. Well, when you were kind of developing it, um, did did you have to do a lot of it behind, away from the computer? Because, uh, you know, as you said, there was timeshare and there was other people using the machine and then go to the computer and kind of test it all and get it done there. Well, yes. When I was working on the mainframe computers in college, uh, yes, I would typically what you do is you'd get your printout and then if you were respectable, you would take it back uh, to your office and study it and make all sorts of, you know, write up all sorts of changes. And then you would go back, change your card set and resubmit it. Some people, though, prefer to, there were so many stupid little bugs you could get that a lot of people would just hang around the computer center. And as soon as the thing came back, They'd look it over. I mean, usually it came out with some sort of compile error and it would always be one stupid little mistake and you'd go in and change one card and resubmit it. These were very common problems back then. Did you have to make any kind of physical hardware yourself? Were you you making any add-ons or or kind of, you know, boards to do different things? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I uh, between right after grad school, about a year after that, I built I I finally made the jump into the microcomputer era. Uh, This would be in 1978. I bought a Chem One single board microcomputer system that had a 6502 eight bit CPU running at one megahertz. It had uh, one kilobyte of RAM, which was really big in those days. I mean, that was a lot of RAM. Most of the machines being sold until then had came with 256 bytes of RAM. Uh, let's see. It had a uh, little keypad, 16, uh, uh, about 25 keys on its keypad, and it had six seven-segment LEDs for output, and you uh, you could do an awful lot with that. And I then expanded the system. I built all sorts of stuff. I, I built a power supply for it, a big power supply. These things ate up a lot of power back then. So I had this huge transformer. Actually, I had two transformers for complicated reasons. I had a monster capacitor to smooth out the, uh, the power. Uh, it was a can about, oh, three inches in diameter by maybe six to eight inches high. And, uh, that thing held a lot of, uh, charge and that was necessary for a heavy duty power supply back then. And what else? Uh, well, there were a bunch of other things, but I built this whole system and then I added some boards to it. A 4K memory board, which really blasted off, uh, in turn allowed me to do much larger programs. And then I built an interface board, very complex board that allowed me to have two what I called tiny terminals. These were little. I got some some calculator boxes, and then I got some seven segment LEDs. Seven segment LEDs are the things that you see in digital clocks. 
the red things with the funny letters. Well, those were also what were used in calculators at the time. And I bought a bunch of these. Let's see. They were, I think, 16. No, I think it was only eight per uh, unit. That'd be, there'd be one unit with eight of these seven segment LEDs. And I bought four of those and I stacked two of them one on top of the other, and that unit went inside the little calculator, and that was the output screen. And then I had a calculator keyboard as the input, and then uh, I had two of these, and they had cables that went big, wide ribbon cables with lots of wires, and they uh, went into my interface board, and the Kim One controlled that, and the net result was that the thing could. Uh, I used it for my version of Tanktics for the Kim, which we called Kim Tanktics, and that was a real time game. That was a really good game, a lot of fun. So I'm definitely looking forward to talking more about the Kim One in just a moment. Cause that's you know, as as a Commodore fanboy, you know that was always a company um, that I was into as a kid. It's going to be interesting to hear some more stories about that. But I'm quite interested in that kind of dawn of the microcomputer industry. I mean, when the Altair came along, that must have been a really exciting time. I mean, what was kind of the the atmosphere like in the in the computer world and the science world when that machine debuted? It's interesting among. Computer scientists, the whole, the microcomputers were considered to be something of a joke, uh, toys. Certainly the, uh, uh, the, <laughs> the big iron people considered them to be toys, people using big IBM mainframes. They, they sort of laughed at them as, as toys. And uh, the real enthusiasm was with a group of oddballs. The, the people who got that rolling were, I don't want to use the term revolutionaries, they were enthusiasts who were just really excited. You know, this is really, really neat. And you can do all sorts of fun things with them. And that was the attitude back then. And the passion was very high. People were were terribly excited, people in that group. And that group was it's hard to say how big it is. Perhaps the best measure uh, are the subscription uh, numbers for some of the magazines. Uh, the most representative one would be Byte magazine, which definitely had a, I don't know what their circulation was, but I'm sure it was in the tens of thousands at least. Um and it, it was the flagship magazine. I mean, you just had to read Byte because it, it had the latest news and it had reviews of computer systems and lots and lots of ads for new products. Uh, and people spend as much time on the ads as on the editorial content. Oh, there were also social groups like the Homebrew Computer Club in Silicon Valley. Uh, mm. But those were rare because you needed a real concentration of people to make one of those things work. Well, what kind of things were people doing on these early microcomputers then? Well, they were trying to do all sorts of things, and a lot of it was just crazy, stupid, whatever. Um, (laughs) One of the biggest problems was justifying the expense of the computer to the wife, because these things really <laughs> did cost a lot of money. And so one of the most common programs was the kitchen recipe program that would that your wife could take and she could plug in the recipe for something and type in the numbers and it would tell her how much stuff to use if you're making this for five people instead of six <laughs> and so forth. It was really quite pathetic. But it was really an indication of the social difficulties that people had because these things did cost a lot of money. There were games, but the biggest problem with games was that there was no decent output on these machines. Uh, The idea, in fact, the big thing around, oh, 78 to 79 was a CRT controller. 
uh, that would allow a cathode ray tube that would allow you to get visual output. And that was very special, very expensive, and didn't work very well. And so the, I mean, most people relied on LED output or seven segment LED output. Uh, some people had little printers. Uh, I experimented. I had a little calculator printer that I experimented with, and I could get it to print out numbers. That's all it could do. But we really didn't have much in the way of video output, which is why the Apple was so exciting. It came, The Apple II came out, and it could, boy, we could put output to a, a, a monitor. Wow. And then very shortly afterwards, we had the TRS-80 and the Commodore PET, all of which could put output. Uh, the Commodore PET had everything built in. It had the monitor. It had the tape cassette recorder and player. It had a keyboard. Uh, I mean, this was everything in one package. And this was the first time anybody had ever done anything like that. And that's one reason why the Commodore PET was so popular during those days. Well, before the Commodore Pet, I mean, the Kim was a machine that I know you worked on. And the Kim's always been a really interesting machine for me, because I know it was um, MOS Technologies before um, Commodore took them over. And then that became, you know, Commodore's first, what you call a personal computer, even though obviously it was very limited compared to, you know, what came after. Tell us about your, um, your story with the Kim then. How did you find out about it and get hold of it? Uh, it was in Byte Magazine. Of course. <laughs> and uh, I read some stuff about it. There still wasn't much information. And I still remember calling MOS technology and asking, now, is this a programmable logic array or does it have an actual CPU? And they said, yes, it's, it's a CPU, not a PLA. And I said, I mean, that's a, a, an indication of just how little information there was available back then. And so I uh, I sent them my two hundred and forty five dollars, which was a lot of money back then, and uh, uh, got my Kim one. I still remember the day I got it. I was so excited. I had uh, brought home a uh, a power supply from the physics lab where I was teaching, and. I, I was really scared that I would blow this thing up because in those days, all the MOS technologies were vulnerable to high voltage. I mean, you could easily blow out one of these chips. And I still remember very, very carefully hooking up my power supply to it. And then what I did was I slowly brought the voltage up to five volts. I didn't want to start it at five volts because I was afraid there might be a surge of some sort. And I brought it up, and at like 4.7 volts, all of a sudden, the LEDs lit up. And I took it all the way up to 5, and then I was ready with a test program. Uh, load A immediate, 0, 2. Uh, add with carry, 0, 3. Uh, or clear carry, add with carry, 0, 3. And uh, then store that to the output display. And sure enough, it came back with five. And I said, God, this thing really works. <laughs> I still remember how, how excited I was. <laughs> and I was excited with the fact that it came back so quickly. <laughs> the first book of Kim as well was a, a compilation of kind of computer games for the Kim one. Yep. Were you programming those in as well and testing oh, them yeah. out? Yeah, I got that as soon as it came out. I bought a copy and I put in some of the uh, some of the programs. Uh, really, the the real value of it though was for learning programming techniques from other people. And so I I studied every one of those programs. For the most part, I realized I was I had a pretty good grip on programming the sixty five hundred two, but there were still some interesting tricks in there that I learned from. Uh, actually, the, the best one was a, an article in Byte magazine shortly thereafter called Sweet 16. And uh, it was a program. This was really neat. It, uh, it was basically a kind of a, it was very small. It took less than one kilobyte of RAM. 
but you could enter your program and then have Sweet 16 execute using that, your program, and it would go through and figure out all of the jump distances. One of the biggest problems in uh, programming back then was that your looping was all done and branching was all done with a branch command that specified how many steps in memory you were going to, you wanted it to jump either forwards or backwards. Have you ever counted backwards in hexadecimal? <laughs> no, no, can't say I have. <laughs> Actually, I had gotten pretty good at it, but it was still a pain. And every now and then you made a mistake and the program blew up and it was a major pain. But uh, this thing took care of all of that. And so, boy, that was neat. I, I jumped on that thing. It added a few other things that made life easier for programming the 6502. Well, obviously, you're working on you know the, the, uh, these computer games at the time, and then as we got into the late seventies, the arcade scene and even the home console scene started to explode. That path led you to Atari. Then, what was the the route, and how did you end up at Atari from there? <laughs> Let's see. I had been working at the University of California, Davis, in a in a teaching position, and uh, my wife had, my wife and I had made a deal, which was. Uh, we will live on one salary only so that we can, at any time, uh, you can quit your job and the other per- and it won't hurt us. And the other uh, agreement we had was that whenever one of us had a promotion requiring a move, we would take that, that one, we would do that move. Uh, and my wife, Kathy, had gone through a training program that qualified her as an electrical engineer. And so she got a job down in Silicon Valley, which was about a hundred miles away from where we were living. And so she moved down to Silicon Valley and started working. And I was still at our house, cleaning it up and painting it and, you know, preparing to sell it. And I was also looking for a job in Silicon Valley. And, uh, I found an ad somewhere that said, uh, programmers, uh, design your own games. Uh, and then it had a, uh, a, a phone number and, and a, it was a headhunter in Mountain View. And hmm. so I called him and, uh, and made an appointment and drove down to Mountain View and interviewed with the guy. And I thought I was a shoe in because I had a proven track record. I, I showed him. Here's the first game I made, and I sold 150 copies of this, which at that time was a very impressive number. And here's the second game I did, and I sold 100 copies of this. So I've actually built computer games and sold them. And he was very impressed. And he said, okay, well, one last thing, Mr. Crawford, how many years of programming experience do you have? And I said, oh, I started programming way back in high school. He said, no, no, not just programming. How many years of employment as a programmer do you have? And I said, well, I've I've never had a job as a programmer. I've done an enormous amount of programming, Fortran and BASIC and, uh, you know, 6502. But, gee, I've, I've never had a job as it. And he said, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Crawford. This job requires at least three years of employment as a programmer. And I said, but, 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 but I've actually done these games. And the guy stood up, <laughs> stuck his hand out and said, uh, thank you, Mr. Crawford. Uh, have a good day. And that evening I called my wife uh, down in Silicon Valley and, <laughs> and she immediately grabbed the phone book and said, here, here, I'll, I'll find, I'll find something. And she flipped through yellow pages and then she came to games and the first entry on the, on there was something called Atari. And she said, I'll call them in the morning and see what I can get. And so she called them and she spoke to the, uh, the HR people who were the input for the hiring and told them about my situation. And the HR lady was rather, you know, perfunctory with her. And said, okay, well, can he come down for an interview now? 
And my wife said, uh, no, he's up in Davis right now. Now, Davis is a small town in California that is really just a university town. It has the University of California, Davis, and that's all it has. And so when the lady heard that I was in Davis, she said, oh, gosh, are you guys Aggies? Well, Aggie was what an alumnus of Davis was called. And Kathy said, why, yes, we both are. And the HR lady said, so am I. That's really great. (laughs) Well, here, let's schedule an interview for him. And that's how I got my foot in the door at Atari. I went down, had the interview, and they loved me. And uh, I got the job immediately, went to work. And about two weeks later, I discovered that the headhunter who had turned me down was trying to fill the position that I took. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I think the uh, the planets aligned for you there then, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you joined there, I mean, obviously, the, you know, the Atari VCS was like the biggest system on the planet. I mean, yeah. y- your initial role there was programming the VCS, I believe. And what was that a difficult machine to program with such limited resources? I mean, I, what did it have, like 128 bytes of RAM? Yeah, yeah. And uh, programs had to fit in 2K of ROM. The VCS at the time was was a very difficult machine to understand because you had to keep up with the uh, b- electron beam as it raced across the TV screen, and you had to be synchronized with it. And so you the timing requirements were extremely tight. It turned out that you could your the most important. Uh, part of your program that did most of the display had to operate with just 76 machine cycles, which meant typically maybe 35 instructions. And that's all you had to work with. You had to get all the graphics in, in 35 instructions. And (laughs) that required immense cleverness. But you know, we had developed techniques and I was taught, you know, here's some of the things you can do to squeeze it into 76 cycles. Although every now and then you'd be working in your office and suddenly you'd hear somebody down the down the hall shout, 77! <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was very difficult, uh, but I, I learned it fairly quickly. And I actually got a game up and running. I started there right at the beginning of September of 1979. And I had my program up and running by December, which was very fast. And unfortunately, by that time, see, uh, I had to make it fit in 2K of ROM. And by that time... Atari was making the transition to 4K ROMs because it found you could do so much more in 4K that uh, the 2K ROMs were just too inferior. And so in sometime in December of 79, I sent my game over to marketing so they could look it over. And they came back and said, uh, this is good, but uh, can you redo it in 4K? And I went back to them and said, I can design a new game in 4K, but you don't take a 2K game and fluff it up to 4K. That's That produces junk. You know, I'd have to start all over from scratch and design a completely new game. And uh, they hummed and hawed, and meanwhile, basically, they allowed me to go to work on the Atari 800, which is what I wanted to work on anyway. And so basically that game uh, sort of died or was abandoned. And that was Wizard, yeah? Yeah, that was Wizard. And hmm. then the uh, and I went to work on the Atari 800. Yeah, because Wizard, I know, eventually got a release on the, um, the Atari Flashback yeah. in, I think it was like two, 2005, six or something, wasn't it? It was a long time later. Well, actually, yeah, there, there were versions of it available earlier. And in fact, I'm not sure... See, I had the master ROMs for it, and I had the, you know, the printout and so forth. 
And sometime in the late 80s or early 90s, somebody got in touch with me over the internet and wanted to know if they could have the source or something like that. They wanted some, they wanted to have it and, you know, build it. And I said, yeah, sure. And I emailed them what they needed. And uh, they actually got a version of Wizard up and running. And that then started spreading around and I didn't even bother keeping track of it. But I know that version was floating around the internet in the 90s. So I don't know what, if it became the source of the other things. Well, you mentioned that you moved on to the Atari home computers. Um, and I know the Atari 400 and 800, you know, Jay Miner was involved in those machines and they've got a great reputation. And everyone we talked to that's worked on those computers raves about how incredible they were. Yep. What were they like to work on personally for you and how did they compare to other micros on the market? Well, for me, uh, it took me a little while. I mean, I learned the, the technical aspects of it fairly quickly. But there were a few things that were really subtle, uh, primarily the scrolling capability and, most important, the display list interrupt. You just got to understand a lot about the, the machine to realize just how powerful that is. But uh, I learned all this stuff at sort of a basic level fairly quickly, but then I kept experimenting and learning more and more how to do this. Within a year, I had the scrolling system up and running. And I remember, oh, well, there was another thing going on at the time. At some point, Atari had initially taken the attitude of, we're going to keep all the software to ourselves. We're not going to let anybody else make software on the 800 because that's where we're going to get rich. And so no technical information about the computer was allowed out. Well, I had a lot of friends through the industry, and they would call me every now and then and say, so, Chris, uh, can you tell me about the 800? And I would say, no. But I would occasionally give answer a few questions. But uh, then one day, somebody somehow convinced Ray Kassar, the CEO of Atari, that no, we want lots of people making lots of software for the Atari because that's what sells the hardware. And so he sent out a memo one day. We are now, we have changed our policy. Now all the technical information on the Atari uh, 800 is and 400 is now publicly available. And the moment I read that, I picked up the phone and started making phone calls. Then I collected together all of the technical documentation that I had, and I had it reproduced, and it was several hundred pages of stuff. So we printed it off, and I started shipping copies of that stuff. Well, because I had been explaining it, and, and I'm a pretty good explainer, uh, shortly thereafter, Atari had a meeting of its sales representatives who were getting clobbered in the field. Apple was just outselling Atari uh, enormously, and the sales reps were actually kind of depressed. They felt like, you know, we just can't win. And so one of the marketing people invited me, said, would you mind talking to the salespeople about, you know, the technical capabilities of the machine? And I got up there and I gave a rip-snorting, you know, lecture talking about all the wonderful things that Atari could do and how it it ate Apple's lunch at every on everything and was just completely, totally, absolutely superior to the Apple in every possible way. And they came out of that supercharged and they were ready, you know, let us at them. We're gonna go out there and we're gonna sell a million of these. And <laughs> so the marketing people really liked me for that. And shortly thereafter, a number of things came together and I ended up forming a group of people called the Software Development Support Group. And our job was to train people to program the Atari. And we did a series of uh, seminars. We would somehow advertise it. I forgot how we had somebody 
calling up people saying, oh, you know, we're going to have this Atari seminar thing and it's free and uh, you'll get all sorts of documentation. And why don't you come? And so we'd have about 30 at any given place. And I, I would uh, show up there and I developed this really, I took the thing I gave to the uh, salespeople and I really jazzed it up. I mean, I showed off all, all the things the Atari could do. For example, give you an idea of the, the tone or style of this, I would take the Atari joystick and I would swing it by its cable and then smash it down onto the table and say, <laughs> this is how Atari stuff is built. And then I'd plug it in and use it. Uh, you know, the Apple stuff is for hobbyists, but if you're talking consumers, remember, these are the people who put their fingers underneath the lawnmower and then sue the company afterwards because their fingers were cut off uh, and they, and win their suit. You know, this, this is who we're selling to. And uh, it was really a high energy presentation. And I think it was a reporter from Byte who attended it and then went back that I was, that my presentation was like an old time software event or evangelistic revival meeting. That's the, he was, a, I, basically I was the first software evangelist. Uh, and it was this guy at this magazine who coined the term. So anyway, the, uh, those were very successful and we got a lot of people writing software for the Atari I know it's all we were mainly known for arcade games in kind of that era, but you were working on some really interesting things. You did um, something in uh, Atari Basic called a Scram, which was a nuclear power plant simulator, yeah. which, uh, you know, obviously an educational title. What was the story with that then? And how did you convince Atari to release that? Uh, well, actually, the first one I did was called Energy Czar, and that was an educational simulation of, energy, environment, economics, trade-offs. And you were given options about what you wanted to tax and what you wanted to subsidize. God, it was a really bad program. But for the time, it was it was pretty damn good. It was certainly much more sophisticated than any of the other stuff out there. And the reason why it was was because I'd spent the last two years teaching people about energy issues. And so I knew all this stuff cold and I had huge reference database. And uh, so it was a very well resourced uh, game. Uh, <laughs> there's an interesting story about it though. Whenever you got a program ready to go, you would, uh, you had to have it, you had to pass it by marketing. And what you do is the marketing people would all come over to software and they'd troop into a meeting room and then you'd get up in front of them and, you know, show off your wonderful program. Now, at that time, Atari had a very clear policy that games were for the 2600 and the 800 and 400 were for educational software and, you know, serious software, but not games. Atari did not want any games on the 400, 800, because they would cannibalize sales for the 2600. Mm -hmm. And so I showed off the energy czar thing. And uh, uh, when I was done, the vice president of marketing looked at me very coldly and said, is this a game? Because you did get points and you could win or lose. And so he said, is this a game? And I looked at him and said, no, 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 educational simulation. And he looked at me for a, lot, for a minute and then he said, I don't know. It looks pretty fun to me. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they still approved it. <laughs> well, uh, another influential title that you did was um, Eastern Front. Um, can yeah. you tell us about that? Uh, actually, that started off as a demo for my uh, – seminars. That is, I wanted to show people the wonderful scrolling capabilities of the Atari, which were way, way beyond anything anybody else had ever come, uh, had ever done. No, no Apple could even come remotely close to doing that. And so I built a little demo and to show off what it was scrolling, I built sort of a map thing. And then I would show 
scrolling on this machine. And this blew people away because there was this huge map and you could smoothly scroll all over for it. Scrolling back then wasn't done because the computers were too gutless. They just simply couldn't move the pixels around that fast. And here was this thing doing this sm beautiful, smooth scrolling. So that really impressed a lot of people. Um, but they seemed slow to uh, embrace it. And so I just kept advancing it. And then I thought one day, you know, why don't I try to make a war game out of this? So I replaced my little demo map with a map of Russia. And I thought, oh, that's nice. I wonder if I can put, you know, military units down, you know, little symbols for military units. And so I did some more programming. Clunk, 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 clunk. Here were these, you know, divisions and so forth. And then I said, well, can I make a move? And I uh, added some more code and they were hopping around on the map. And then I put in input control stuff to allow the user to specify where they were moving. And then I added some artificial intelligence and this and that and so forth. And I had Eastern Front. Well, actually, not quite. It turns out there, this is a very important point that I think uh, is still relevant. When it was first done, I, I let's see. I started the seminars in December of 1980, and in June of 81, I had Eastern Front running, and it was crap. It was not mm -hmm. fun. It was tedious and boring, and I had the great good sense to say, this, this game isn't ready. This is a very important point because most games are crap when they're first built. And the designer has to have the courage to say, all right, we're going to make some big changes to this baby. And then needs the genius or the luck to figure out what those changes are. In my case, with Eastern Front, the problem was that there were too many units. The unit density was too high. And you spent all your time giving orders to these units. And they got stuck with each other. And uh, I... The solution was something from uh, old uh, board war games, and that was something called a zone of control. And I said, let's use that. And boy, that really thinned out the uh, unit count and left it, mm. made it easy to have gaps in the line that you could pour through. And that made it into a great game. Uh, of course, it took a lot of tuning. I, the big change was in, around the middle of June, and we shipped the product in early August. And by the way, in those days, game design cycles were very fast. Uh, in fact, in 1981, I had Energy Czar shipped early that year, Scram shipped a little later, Eastern Front shipped in August. Oh, and then Tactics shipped. So I had four games coming out in one year. <laughs> Very busy era for you. And I mean, actually, you know, skipping forward a couple of years, you know, you went on to found something that is now um, an annual go-to for game developers from all around the world. You know, we know it was GDC today. Yeah. But in 1988, it was called the, uh, the Computer Game Developers Conference. Tell us about that then and why there was a need for it. Uh, the games industry went through a collapse in 1984. Almost everybody lost their jobs. And in 1985, it was still in very bad shape. And then it slowly started recovering in 86. But there were still very few programmers, designers. But in 87, I decided that I could do a journal, you know, that it was time for us to start talking about game design. I had already written and published a book, The Art of Computer Game Design. So I did this thing called the Journal of Computer Game Design published a 16-page issue every two months, and I wrote most of it, but as the word spread, more people started subscribing and writing material for it, and the user base expanded. We ended up with about 300 subscribers at the peak, and Nikki Robinson su suggested to me, why don't you, you put together a conference? And I had actually been a little reluctant to do that. But by that time, it was about the right time. I felt there are enough people now 
to to justify this. So uh, I organized the first one at my home, and we had about two dozen people come. And there's a photograph of the uh, of the group that we took that's on the internet in a lot of places. And everybody was so pleased with that. It was just a one day affair that they said, Chris, you got to do this again. This needs to be a regular thing. So at that point, I, uh, I said, all right, let's, let's do this. And the first decision I made was this will be much better if I bring in different points of view. And so I recruited, uh, I think six other people. And I went out of my way to get a disparate group of people with different kinds of interests. And I recruited them as board members. The second decision I made, which was stupid, was I said, we're going to be very egalitarian about all of this. Uh, This will be a corporation and everybody will be equals. And so I will uh, be no better than anybody else. And everybody has the same amount of stock. And then the third decision uh, I made, which was also a disaster, was actually not my decision. I wanted to incorporate as a nonprofit corporation. However, the guy who ended up being the treasurer said, whoa, geez, nonprofit. You got to do all sorts of paperwork with the government to be a nonprofit. And you got to make financial reports. And it's just, uh, it'd be a huge job. It would be so much easier if we just made this a for-profit and then we just didn't make a profit. Uh, it's, it, it's effectively the same thing. And I said, well, okay, if you think so. I believe strongly that you, you know, the guy in the trenches is the guy who makes the decision. So I went with that and that proved to be a disastrous mistake. So uh, anyway, we got started and it was a big success and grew and grew and grew. Before we finish, tell us about interactive storytelling. Ah, that was my, uh, has been my grand dream now for 30 years. I started working on it uh, in 1991 and I had always felt that computer games were stuck by 1990, by the early 90s, they were creatively frozen. They were in a rut. And they are still in that same rut. That is, games nowadays are pretty much, this. we've got the same genres as we had 30 years ago. There's been no real creative expansion. And I realized that the fundamental reason for this was that the games were not about people. And I boiled the idea down to a slogan, people, not things, because you really, I I felt that until we have games about people and interactions between people, dramatically significant interactions, our games will never be art and they will never break out of the rut they're in. So we got to do games about people and what that boils down to is interactive storytelling. And I've been working on that for 30 some odd years. Actually, I started with uh, Excalibur on the Atari. It had some strong people elements. I did another one at Atari called Gossip, which was actually a spinoff from Excalibur that was exclusively about people, uh, people interactions. Uh, In 87, I did a game called Seaboot, or Trust and Betrayal, that was fundamentally about interpersonal interactions. And so I tried to develop these ideas, and I did. Over the last 30 years, I developed an enormous amount of technology, um, but it was never good enough. Now, maybe I'm too much the perfectionist, and maybe I should have been releasing technology even that I consider to be flawed, but I just kept... I'd I'd get something working and I'd work with it and say, no, not good enough, throw it away, start over. And I basically, whenever I can a project, I sit for about a year doing other things, allowing the creative juices to bubble. And I came up with another idea, radically different from anything I've ever done before. 
a year and a half ago, I began working on an actual project um, based on the Arthurian legends that I call Le Mort d'Arthur. And I've been working on it for a year now, developing the technology for it and developing it. The basic challenge of the game was that the player is King Arthur and he's managing a motley group of, uh, of knights who are, have their own interests and conflicts. And, so, and meanwhile, they're the Saxons who are constantly attacking and they represent a military threat. And the basic idea of the game was that you'd have military aspects, but the real challenge was finding the right balance between uh, being feared and being loved. Uh, That is, there were times when you, uh, for example, when you'd be presented with a murder. One of the people murdered another one. Uh, What are you going to do about it? Uh, uh, And so you have a, a... a trial, in effect, and you hear everybody's stories, and at the end of the trial, you got to make a decision. Do you execute the murderer? Do you acquit him because it's justified homicide or whatever? And, you know, one decision is going to make you feared, and one is going to make you loved by some people. Basically, there's an awful lot of this in there, and there's an awful lot of, of color in the sense of telling you what Britain was like around the year 500 when Arthur was doing his stuff. And uh, I felt that that would be good enough. But then right at the beginning of this year, I was thinking one day, you know, this lacks anything about the, the grail and the grail quest. And wouldn't it be nice to get that in there somewhere? And I thought about it a lot. And then all of a sudden, a new idea hit me. And I will not tell you what the idea is. I'm, I'm going to tease you here. But basically, right, right. it takes the game off in a completely different direction, but leaves the old game in place. And uh, so basically what, what's going to happen here is all these gamers are going to get in. They're going to start playing it like it's a war game, and they'll concentrate on, the, uh, on winning the battles. And then they'll lose the game because the people don't really support him and there will be a rebellion. And then they'll go back and play a few more times and figure out how to get a right balance between being feared and being loved. And even then they won't have it right because there's this third layer of the game that is totally outside the cognitive universe of most gamers. I think this will be the first thing that anybody has ever done in this field that can genuinely be called art. So I'm, we'll see. We'll see. I I don't want to make any promises, but this is certainly the first time I felt like I really could end up with art when I'm done with this. Well, Chris, you've been innovating for over 40 years now, and if anyone can uh, reinvigorate the games industry and come up with something new, then I think you know, you're the right guy for the job, Chris. I feel like you know we've been talking for over an hour. We've, we've barely scratched the surface of the, the incredible projects and games you've worked on throughout your career, but um, it's been incredible getting some of your stories, Chris. Thank you so much for coming on and, uh, and being our guest, and we can't wait to see your new project when it's finally ready. Okay, it was fun. 